You know, as a minister, my job uh, brings me into people's lives when they are extremely happy and when they're extremely sad. Doesn't seem to be a lot of middle ground. It's one or the other many times. For example, I've baptized souls into Christ. Very happy, happy moment. Uh, I've performed weddings, lots of weddings. I've been there to pray when uh, babies have been born. Talk about happy moments. And of course, it's wonderful to participate in those joyful moments in a family's life. You kind of share that with them on an ongoing basis. Of course, on the other hand, I've received a lot of calls in a single week from members telling me that they have just received news that they have cancer of some kind, or perhaps a parent has died, or a child has been in a car wreck, and you know, the list goes on and on and on. You know, ministry is a, is a kind of a roller coaster emotional ride as you go from high to low, sometimes several times in a single week. You know, I tell people, you're going through your crisis, that's your crisis, and it doesn't make it less difficult. But the ministers, the elders, they're along for the ride for everybody's crisis, and they're along for the ride for everyone's happiness. So happiness, you know, with all this, what I'm trying to say is that happiness is easy to share. My role is usually to help celebrate and offer praise to God for the blessings of the moment. Trouble and tragedy, however, are a little tougher because there is usually less to say and not much you can do when people are extremely ill or have just lost a loved one. Thankfully, God knew that we would experience both good and bad in life, and He has provided words to help us celebrate as well as to help us mourn during these times. And so in Psalm 27, the author David provides an example of the kind of attitude that a believer should have when facing the tough moments. Remember I said, you know, the Bible provides the words. In Psalm 27, David provides the words that believers can cling to, can look at when they're facing difficult moments. This attitude can be summarized in one word, however. We'll go through the whole psalm in a moment, but one word, we can compress all the ideas into one word, and that is trust. Trust. David, in this psalm, however, describes not just the word trust, but a lot of facets of trust that a true child of God should have because of his relationships with God. You know, some people have the wrong idea of this, this concept called trust. They think you know, trust is uh, crossing your fingers and oh boy, you know, I sure hope so, crossing fingers. You know, they think that's trust. Or some people think that trust is a kind of resignation. Oh well, you know, we don't have a choice, might as well pray, might as well leave it on God. You know. No other option. Or some people think that it's, uh, usually in the movies, you know, blind faith or optimism. They say, oh, don't worry, trust me, everything will be okay. And I'm yelling at the TV, really? How do you know everything is going to be? Why are you saying that? How do you know everything's going to be okay? Well, David shows in his prayer that real trust in God has much more noble and specific qualities than the ones I've just mentioned. For example, David says that trust is fearless. Read with me, Psalm 27, verses one, two, and three. He says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? When evildoers came upon me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies, they stumbled and fell. Though a host encamp against me, 
my heart will not fear. Though war arise against me, in spite of this, I shall be confident. Do you see it? Do you see how it shines through? His trust is without fear. In the first verses, he gives reasons why he is not afraid of putting his trust in the Lord. He says, the Lord is the one who enlightens him. The Lord is the one that gives him understanding. The Lord is the one that tells him it'll be okay, because the Lord has the right to say it'll be okay. The Lord is the one who will ultimately save his soul, David says. He compares the damage that his enemies can do to him against the ultimate power of the Lord and he concludes that there is nothing to be afraid of. Wait a minute, on this hand I've got the Lord and on this hand I have my enemies. Wait a minute, hey, these guys, they don't have a chance because I have the Lord. Of course, his point is that God has given him the ability to understand that his enemies can only harm him physically, and then only some of the times. His soul, however, is safe from God. It is out of the reach of his enemies, so he has trust, fearless trust in God. You know, some are brave only when they are in a superior position or winning the battle, that's when they have confidence. David is fearless even when he is outnumbered, because no enemy can remove what is most precious to him, and that's his soul and his salvation. Brothers and sisters, we live within our soul. That thing inside of us that thinks and feels and judges and yes, is afraid, that's the soul. And David says that thing, the essential me, no one can take that away from me because God protects that. They can take away this part, you know, the envelope, they can take that, but they can't take the real me, the essential me. And so trust is fearless when it can stand before great enemies and not blink an eye knowing what John says in his gospel, or in his letter rather, he that is in you is greater than he who is in the world, First John. Chapter four, verse four. Well, David goes on in his psalm, not only is trust fearless, he says trust is joyful. Let's keep reading, verse four. He says, one thing I have asked um, from the Lord that I seek, that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in His temple. For in the day of trouble He will conceal me in His tabernacle, in the secret place of His tent He will hide me. He will lift me up on a rock. And now my head will be lifted up above my enemies around me and I will offer in His tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. You know, a trust in God that is sad or fatalistic or doubtful is not really trusting God. You're not really trusting in God if you're walking around angry and sad and pessimistic. Where's the, where's the glory there? How is God honored by that? If your trust in God is really in God, it will be full of joy, full of praise. You know, David speaks with confident anticipation of the final victory that he will eventually have. And it leads him to praise God who will provide it. I know I'm going to win. I know I will overcome. I know I will be with Him. I know my soul is safe. I know what I'm looking forward to. I know what He has put in store for me. I know it. And nobody can take that away from me. And as I contemplate all these things that I know, I have great joy. I am moved to praise God. He says that through his trouble he has remained close to God by worshiping Him and meditating on His word. 
And this experience has focused his attention away from his problems and focused his, uh, refocused his attention onto the Lord. And the result is a grateful and joyful spirit of praise. In times of trouble and tragedy, you know, the first thing that we want to do usually is go into a corner and hide. We don't want to talk. We don't want to communicate. We just want to be left alone. Retreat from the world and from the Lord as well. Or maybe if we come out into the world, it's to complain and criticize. David does the exact opposite in his time of trouble. He asks God to draw him closer to his side during these times. He asks God to hide him inside his dwelling place to allow him a more intimate knowledge of the Lord than he has had in the past. I know it's a strange thing, it's counterintuitive, but as I lose my life, some of us, some of us call that getting older, but really what it is, is as I lose my life, as I see my youth and my strength and my vitality, as I see it dissipating, I am drawn closer to God because I am less able to latch on to this world. I am less able to mold the world to my liking. I see more clearly my weakness, my impending death. And to someone who doesn't believe that's a cause of sorrow or panic, but to someone who does believe it's a cause of great peace and joy because the dissipation of this life brings into focus more clearly the reality of the next life. And so David says his troubles and enemies may still be there, but the new vision, the deeper relationship with God has caused him to rejoice and praise the Lord with great enthusiasm. Here's where we see the link between suffering and joy. Suffering causes us to trust God more and more. And the greater our trust, the greater our vision and our appreciation of God. The greater our understanding of God, the greater our joy and desire to praise Him. You can't help it. You can't help it. On a beautiful Oklahoma summer day when the sun is fat and hot into the sky, if you take off your sunglasses and look straight into the sun, what, what happens? You, you're blinded, right? You can't help it. You can't keep your eyes open and just keep staring at the sun. It's too bright. Well, David is saying here, when you come closer to God, you can't help but praise. You can't help but be joyful. You can't help it because you're seeing God more clearly. And so David says his trust is fearless. His trust is joyful. And thirdly, he says his trust is confident. Keep reading with me, verse seven. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice and be gracious to me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, O Lord, I shall seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not abandon me nor forsake me, O God, of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me up. And so David reviews his past experiences with the Lord and he notes that God has always answered always helped, always saved him in one way or another. He says that his parents have left him, probably meaning that they have passed away, but God will never leave him. You know, there's great comfort in the fact that the God that we place our trust in is eternal and all-powerful and never-changing. 
We feel confident you know, if our bank is solid or our investments are, are in blue chip stocks. We feel safe if our pension plan is with the government and our medical insurance is paid up. Although, <laughs> these days, as we have found out the hard way, banks and governments fail and insurance companies will drop you if you get too sick. David demonstrate that if our trust is in the Lord, it is surer than even the trust we have in our parents. Because our parents are faithful and loving and loyal, but they are temporal. One day they too will go away. And he says, the one I trust is always there, will always be there. And so he finishes up with a final encouragement in the last few verses. Once he has described the kind of trust that he has in the Lord and why, fearless trust, because God protects what is most precious to us, which is our souls. Joyful trust, because trusting God leads to knowing God, and knowing God leads to joy and praise for God. And then confident trust, because God's care is more loyal and loving than even our parents' care. Having encouraged his readers to trust God, David leaves them with a final exhortation about what to do uh, when in times of trouble, in addition to trusting the Lord. What do you do? I'm in trouble, things are hard. I, I do trust the Lord, what else? Well, we read in verse 11, he says, teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a level path because of my foes. Do not deliver me over to the desire of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and such as breathe out violence. So first he asks God for two things. One, he says, during times of trouble, during the times I'm trusting you, God, please give me enlightenment. Teach me how to deal with my enemies according to your will. His human nature would just as soon destroy his enemies, but this may not be God's purpose or God's will. You know, this is a good prayer for us to make concerning our troubles and our enemies. Dear God, what do you want me to do? Dear Lord, how should I react or how should I act in this situation? You know, God has a purpose for us. Even when we are suffering, He has a purpose for us. We should ask to know what it is, not just for the trouble to go away. A lot of times our prayer is, God, please make this thing stop. Or God, please make the hurt stop. And that's a legitimate prayer. But beyond that prayer is the prayer that says, dear God, what is it that you want me to know? What is it that you want me to do? And then secondly, he says, during this time of difficulty, you should also ask God for protection. And this is a natural request to say to God, please don't let them win over me. Don't let my enemies win over me. Don't let the disease win over me. Don't let the depression win over me. Don't let the problems I have win over me. Don't let my own sins win over me. You know, God saves the soul, yes, but He can also and does many times save the body. You know, Hezekiah prayed for relief from his terminal illness and God granted him 15 more years of life. So we all die, of course, but we can ask for relief from suffering and imminent death. God answers these prayers, and we know that even in this church, we know that. And so in verse 13 he says, I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. So in this verse David says that unless he had trusted the Lord the way that he did and prayed in the way that he did, he would have fallen into despair and it would have fallen apart. So he's writing this psalm about an episode that happened in his past and he's encouraging his readers to trust in God and ask God for what they need. He says that he did this 
and things were so bad that unless he trusted and prayed in the way that he did, he would have fallen apart and given up. And then he finishes the psalm with this beautiful verse, seen this so many times, right? In a frame on somebody's wall. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. And so he ends the psalm with a final word about what to do between the moment you decide to trust the Lord and the moment the Lord rewards that trust. Because trust and prayer are not always answered on the same day that they're made. So what does he say? Be patient. He says, wait on the Lord, and he says it twice twice in the same verse. The same verb, twice in the same verse. You think that might be important? You know, this is not resignation or tapping your toe kind of patient. It's not the whining or begrudging type of waiting. Man, when, when is it going to happen? Man, it's taking so long. Boy, I'm patient, I'm patient. That's not that kind of waiting. The patience that he's talking about, the waiting that he's talking about, is a willingness to wait and endure whatever it takes to finally see the complete work of God in your life or in the life of another person. A lot of times we're not praying for us, we're praying for someone else, that son of mine, that daughter of mine, that uncle of mine, that whatever. Sometimes the only thing you will do in your entire life is plant a seed and the harvest will only come in your old age or even in another lifetime. We got an email from a friend of ours who lives in California uh, and he was a member of the church there in San Diego and he wrote to tell you know, his friends that his mother, his mother had died. She was 105 years old. And he put a little P.S. there after the note. He says, oh, and by the way, I baptized her when she was 103. And she said at the time, it was the best day of her life. How long he waited for her to say, I'm ready now. 103. And God gave her yet another two years to enjoy and to savor her salvation. And so waiting on the Lord is waiting with the knowledge that it will be right, it will be complete, it will be acceptable when God is through with it, no matter how long it takes. And also he says, be strong and be courageous. This doesn't mean that the troubles and enemies don't frighten you. I mean, fear is a natural human emotion. But despite this natural tendency, he says, don't give in to doubt. Don't give in to loss of confidence. Don't give in to discouragement. You don't have to win or have the solution in order to be brave. You need simply to refuse to give up. You need simply to refuse to compromise or be willing to accept a situation without losing faith. This is courage. This is bravery. The adversity may defeat your dreams. The adversity may destroy your health. It may destroy your family, your wealth. But in the end, if you stand firm, continually trusting and waiting on the Lord, this will be the greatest act of courage that you can do. And it will indeed be pleasing to the Lord. Oh, what a different kind of life that we would have if we just trusted in the Lord each day for all of the big and little things in our lives. Oh, what a church we would have. What a congregation we would have if each member had fearless and joyful and confident trust in God who saves, who provides, and who does great and mighty things. So let's each of us make a decision tonight that from now on, we will trust, really trust God with everything and everyone 
in our lives. Oh, what a blessing awaits every person who leaves here tonight having made that decision and that prayer. And only you and God will know that that decision has been made in your life. And so if you need to go beyond that decision, perhaps the decision to confess Christ, and if you have not already done so, repent of your sins and be baptized, well then we encourage you to make that decision as well and come forward for prayer or restoration if need be. But all these things, to be baptized, to be restored, what, all these things, they all require trust in God. Trust that He will forgive. Trust that He will restore. Trust that He will strengthen.